Let's turn now to Hebrews chapter 10. This morning we'd like to concentrate on verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. First of all, he speaks of a couple of things that we have going for us. Verse 19, having boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. That is, into the place of the very presence of God. When Jesus was crucified, we read that the veil of the temple, and of course the veil was to keep men from coming in to the Holy of Holies, lest they would be destroyed. And that veil was torn from the top to the bottom, God signifying that through the death of Jesus, entrance is now available for men to come unto the Father, into the holiest place, into the presence of God, having now this glorious privilege of coming into the presence of God. Jesus opened the door. He said, I am the door. He opened the door for you and for me to be able to come in to the presence of God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. When Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, he said, For through him, that is Jesus, we have access by one Spirit unto the Father, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith in Jesus. Earlier in Hebrews, we read, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Access to God is now possible for man through Jesus Christ. The shedding of the blood of the sacrifice spoke of death. You see, the law had said, the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. And when you would sin and you would bring an offering for sin, a, a sheep or a goat, and you would lay your hand upon the head of that goat, confessing your sin, the priest would slit the throat and take the blood and put it on the altar to make a covering for your sin. But there was a tremendous consciousness of the deadly nature of sin in that practice. When I saw that animal die, and I realized it was sort of as a substitute for me, I deserve to die because of my sin. The consequences of sin is death. And it brought vividly to the person who was offering the sacrifice to his conscience, it would bring very vividly the consequence, the horrible consequence of sin, the deadly nature of sin. Sin is so destructive. It's too bad that people can't realize this. 
Sin is deadly. I see young people standing around smoking cigarettes. And I think, what a tragedy that they don't realize the consequences of their smoking. As they grow older, it can create heart problems. It can cause emphysema. It can cause lesions on their lungs and lung cancer. And the future destructiveness of, of a pleasure of smoking a cigarette People don't stop to realize. And I'm not saying that that's a sin, but it's just endemic of, of things that are sinful. They are destructive to you. Sin has as its nature that of destroying. Jesus said, the enemy has come to rob and to kill and to destroy. And because the consequences are not always immediate, we think that sometimes we're actually getting by with our sins because I haven't seen an immediate consequence, but in time it takes its toll. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. It will destroy relationships. Sin is just destructive, and it is deadly. The wages of sin is death. But we are told, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will cleanse a man from all sin. You see, one of the consequences of sin is that it alienates you from God. It keeps you from God. The prophet Isaiah said, God's hand isn't short, that he cannot save. God's ear is not heavy, that he cannot hear. God's not deaf. But he said, your sins have separated you from God. Now, the wonderful thing is that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And being cleansed of sin, I have this wonderful privilege of coming boldly into the presence of the Lord. Our access to God is through the new and the living way. In the Old Testament... Their access to God was through the Old Covenant, the law, and through the death of the sacrifice. It opened the door for their sins to be covered and for them to sit in fellowship with God. In the New Testament, this new covenant, my access to God is through the life of Jesus. Yes, he gave himself as a sacrifice but he now lives to make this fellowship with God possible, seeing he ever lives to make intercession. So the new way in Christ, the living Christ. Jesus came from the Father, sent by God, and he was God. He came in the flesh. We read or we sing at Christmas time Charles Wesley's hymn, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased with men, with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. The eternal God has become approachable. The eternal God has become touchable through Jesus Christ. John tells us that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. And the Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John began his first epistle with the words, In the, be 
with the words, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have gazed upon, which we have touched. For the life was manifested and we saw him and we bear witness and show to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. God became approachable. God became touchable through his son Jesus. So we read here that through his flesh or body being torn, we now have access to the Father through him. He is the veil. But through him, we enter in to the presence of God. The second thing that we have going for us is that we have a high priest over the house of God. The church is really called in the Bible the house of God, and we are called often the household of God. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you've become fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone, in whom all of the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple of the Lord in whom you also build it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God dwells with his people. We read in Psalm that the Lord inhabits or dwells in the praises of his people. This building is not the church. This building is only a building. You are the church. You are the house of of God. God dwells in the midst of his people. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. He dwells in the midst of his church. When you're not here, this is just a building, nothing more. When you are here, it becomes the place where the church gathers. And so you, though, constitute the church. You are the building of God, and you are the dwelling place. God dwells in the hearts of his people as they gather together to worship him. Now, we have, first of all, access to the presence of God through Jesus, the living way. We have Jesus as our great high priest, interceding in our behalf. Therefore, because of this, we are exhorted to three things. They begin with the words, let us. And someone preached a sermon one time, three heads of lettuce out of this passage. <laughs> but uh, exhorting, first of all, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith because we can come boldly into the presence of God, because we have this great high priest, Jesus Christ, let us draw near unto God with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We are promised that if we will draw near to God, he will draw near to us. But we must draw near with a true heart. God hates hypocrisy. And we see in the New Testament how in the early church God dealt so severely with hypocrisy. When Ananias and Sapphira sought to deceive the church, pretending to give everything to God when in reality they were holding back. It was hypocrisy and God dealt with it very severely because both of them died immediately as the result of their attempting to deceive the church of Jesus Christ. And so we must draw near 
unto the Lord with a true heart. But then we also draw near with the full assurance of faith. You see, in the Old Testament, there was a tremendous fear in approaching God. Even the high priest, when he would approach the holiest or the holy of holies, once a year on Yom Kippur, when he would offer the sacrifices, he would do it with tremendous fear. He would do it after many washings, the changing of his clothes, and, and then trembling, he would enter in behind the veil to enter into the presence of God. For the priest knew that if there were some sin involved in his life, that he would be smitten dead in the presence of God. He had a chain around his foot that would remind him that if he goes in there and is not right, he'll be dead and they'll drag him out by the chain that's tied to his foot. And thus there was that fear in approaching God. But with us, we're told that we can come boldly unto the Lord. And so let us draw near with a heart that is true and with full assurance of faith. How wonderful it is, that blessed assurance that we have when we approach God. I no longer need to be distanced from God. I can draw near to God. My great high priest has offered himself as the sacrifice for my sin, and he's opened the door for fellowship whereby I can fellowship with God. Because he said our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience. The priest used to take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it upon the altar to make the covering for the people's sins. And so when that would happen, there was that tremendous consciousness of sin, the feelings of guilt. But I can come boldly to fellowship with God because my heart has been sprinkled, so to speak, with the blood of Jesus, and thus I have been freed from the guilt consciousness. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. All of your sins have been forgiven. You have been washed and cleansed from the past sins that once plagued you and plagued your conscience. Those sins that kept you separated from God, they have been abolished, they've been wiped out, they've been erased as far as God is concerned. And thus, I can come with a conscience that is clear. Because Jesus Christ has provided for me the complete forgiveness of my sin. I've been purified and cleansed through Jesus. Second, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. The book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews. Thus the title. Jews who had come to realize that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Their eyes were open to the prophecies of the Old Testament and they realized that their Messiah had to suffer and to die, that that was prophesied of him. And so they came to the place of embracing Jesus as their Messiah. But there was something quite beautiful about the ritual within the temple. And some of them were sort of being drawn back into Judaism and were almost to the place of seeking to offer sin offerings again of a goat or a, uh, or a lamb or whatever. And, and they were being 
pulled back into the old ways. And so the encouragement here is, let's hold fast the profession of our faith. Back in chapter 2, they were exhorted to take the more earnest heed to these things that they had heard, lest they should drift away from them. And, and some of them were drifting back into Judaism. And of course, in this chapter, we'll find the warning that uh, to drift back, there is no further sacrifice for your sins. The, the animals will no longer work. They'll, they're no longer... Uh, F, uh, is it F efficatory? F well, efficacious. That's, that's good enough. Uh, <laughs> for sins. It's a word. Look it up. So hold fast your profession of faith in Jesus Christ without wavering. James said that a person who wavers were like the waves of the sea that are driven with the wind and tossed. They're unstable. We have to have that Direct purpose, not swerving from it, unwavering in our faith in the Lord. And so we are to hold fast this profession of faith because he is faithful who has promised. God has made a promise of redemption through his son Jesus Christ, and you can be sure he doesn't waver. He is faithful in the promise that he has made to us. We read in Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said it, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Just before Joshua died, he stood before the people of Israel and he, and he told them, I'm going to die. Behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all of your souls that not one thing has failed of all of the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. Everything has come to pass, and not one thing has failed. Speaking of the faithfulness of God, everything God said he would do, he has done. Not one thing has failed. Here's Joshua, probably up around 120 or so, and telling the people, look, God is faithful he has kept his word. He's kept his promises. And you can be sure that God will keep his word. In Isaiah 25, Isaiah said, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithful and true. He's faithful who has promised. Thirdly, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to good works. We have access to the presence of God. We have the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Let's draw near to the Lord in the full assurance of faith. Let's hold fast our profession of faith without wavering. And let us consider how that we can provoke one another to love and to good works. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. The Church is called the body of Christ. There are 
many members, even as there are many parts in your body. And every part of your body is important to the rest of the body. My hand is a very important part of my body, but if my hand were cut off from my body and just lying there on the piano, it's not going to be of much use. Just the hand by itself, it has no value. It's as the hand is a part and attached to the body that the hand is useful and is beneficial. So a person who says, well, I don't need the church. I have my own little fellowship with God. and, and all. They're saying, I don't really need the body. I'm just an eye out here and I can be, you know, just looking around. And, uh, <laughs> but in reality, if, if you don't have a brain, even the eye is of no value. Cut off from the rest of the body. And so the body of Christ is interrelated, interdependent, and we all need each other in the body of Christ. No lone rangers. And we should be concerned with every part of the body of Christ, even those who seem to have a less distinguished place in the body. My big toe is a part of my body and a very important part of my body. Try to run in the sand without a big toe and you'll find out just how important that part of your body is. But for the most part, it lives in a dark, smelly place. <laughs> People don't notice it, though it is important. Now, if the church, well, if, if the church would function like a body, how glorious it would be. But so often we find the church trying to function sort of, or members of the church trying to function independently. And I don't like where I am. It's dark, it's smelly. I want to be where I can be noticed. And, but my big toe would look very peculiar in the middle of my forehead and wouldn't accomplish anything there. God has placed each one of us in the body as pleases Him. And we need to be encouraging one another, looking out for one another, and finding ways to encourage people to love and encourage people uh, to uh, good works. Have you ever stopped to think of what if each part of your body was so independent that it didn't want to cooperate with the rest? You'd say to your hand, pick up that book. And the hand would say, I don't want to. Pick it up with your teeth if you want to. <laughs> and yet that's what we see in the church sometimes. Each one trying to act independent of the rest. But the problems that develop through that. And so we need to provoke one another or encourage one another, challenge one another, to love, because really, love is the answer. When there is a division within the body, when people are at odds, and I'm not speaking to him and all, and I don't want to have anything to do with him, uh, we need to encourage them to love. And look, here's what the Lord would have us to do. And he wants us to love, and he wants us to forgive. He wants us to be kind and considerate and, and things of this nature. So we need to develop ways of encouraging one another to love and to good works. And then we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so much the more so as we see the day approaching. What day? The day of the coming of the Lord. As we enter into these last days, 
how important it is that we spend more time in fellowship with one another. Encouraging one another, exhorting one another. We are living in a world that is becoming more and more antagonistic toward the Christian and the Christian faith. And thus, we need the strength that we garner as we are together and as we are exhorting one another and so much more as we are getting closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And so we have access to God. What a glorious privilege. We have Jesus as our high priest. How wonderful that is. So let's approach the Lord. Let's draw near with a true heart, full assurance. Let's hold fast our profession of faith, not wavering. And let's encourage one another to love and to good works as more and more we take the opportunity of gathering together to be strengthened and to minister to one another in the fellowship. Shall we pray? Father, how thankful we are that we have this boldness of access to you. <laughs> that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy. Lord, how thankful we are that we have such a great high priest who has entered into heaven for us. And Lord, help us now to take full advantage of all that you've provided that we might, Lord, come boldly unto you, holding fast our profession of faith and encouraging one another to love and to good works. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, we'll be assembling tonight at 7 o'clock to study the whole 10th chapter of Hebrews. Uh, We'll find out whether or not you are doers or just hearers of the word. May the Lord be with you. And may we indeed take advantage of all of these blessed privileges that have been provided for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our great high priest. Let's not slack, but let's be diligent, even more so than ever, as we're getting so close to the day of the Lord's return. May the Lord bless you and cause you to be a light that is shining in a dark place, the world in which we live. May you be a sweet savor to those around you as you live in the presence of the Lord. May that love and that grace of God just sort of flow forth from your life, changing the workplace, changing the people that you meet because of the gentleness and the love that God manifests through your life. May this be a beautiful week. A lot of opportunities to assemble of our, ourselves together, all the more so as we see the day of the Lord coming so near.